Hi, and welcome to this week's Auspicious Agile video blog. This is John Okoro. This week we're going to talk about Agile contracts. We want to look at how we do Agile contracts and some of the key factors to look at. To begin with, we want to look at working with a few key vendors, which is a key setup for us in terms of working with Agile contracts. Then we want to look at considerations for how we structure the contracts. We're doing this from a business perspective, uh, not so much from a legal one. And then looking at how we measure the delivery and the return on investment uh, for our Agile contracts. So let's jump right in and take a look. We'll take the example of a company that we'll call Acme Inc., who is working with transitioning from working with traditional waterfall with their vendors, and they would like to start doing Agile contracts. So Acme Inc. has several vendors that they work with. Uh, we will picture them as servers uh, to keep it fun here. Uh, so each one of these vendors, this first one is an offshore, well-known offshore development house. They also work with another major leading offshore development house. Uh, maybe this one is based in India and does a lot of their development as well. Uh, and they work with a third uh, offshore uh, development house as well and also combined with some in-house development capabilities which they treat as a vendor as well for purposes of their delivery. So their agile delivery is going to take place in working with these three existing vendors that they have that they've worked with in the past. And now one of the first things that Acme is going to need to do is to look at how they capture the knowledge as they transition to Agile. They don't want to simply have the vendors work and do delivery, but they don't have an understanding internally of what's being done or how it's being done, what the velocity is of their projects, the backlogs. They want to know all of that information so they can track it, they have visibility into it, and they have all that information flowing to a common platform. So for vendor one, our offshore shop, Vendor two, our existing partner, and vendor three, the internal and hybrid offshore. We want to make sure that we have a tool and platform in place that is going to be able to help them to capture for agile lifecycle management, agile project management, and to be able to help them to capture the velocity, the backlogs, and the releases that their vendors are doing as they're working. That helps us to capture knowledge in the long term so that they're able to better track, and if they want to work with new vendors, they can. So very key to get the right tooling in place. Now, we also want to, we mentioned those key vendors. It is a very good idea to have some key vendor relationships, maybe some agile development shops or organizations that are going to be able to help in that area and are comfortable contracting with you to do agile development uh, because we want to maintain that knowledge and retain all that work we're putting in in those key relationships. We don't want to find that two, three years down the road, we've lost all of the knowledge that we have done for earlier Agile projects. So we want to try to maintain relationships with some key vendors uh, and, of course, having the right tooling and platform in place for enterprise scaling of Agile and Agile project management is going to be essential to supporting that. Let's look at contracts now. So once we have the tooling in place, we have our key vendors and developers that are going to work with us in Agile, we want to be able to structure an Agile contract. Again, we're not looking at this from a legal perspective, but we are looking at this from a perspective of types of contracts. So one is going to be a fixed price, a traditional contract, and the risk really is going to the vendor here. Uh, because the vendor is going to hopefully understand their velocity. They know their team size and the cost of that team. We should understand that as well. The vendor is also going to need to know the velocity, and you're going to need to know the velocity. So you know how much work the team is able to complete in any sprint or iteration. And of course, as we talk about sprints and iterations, we also need to know what the iteration or sprint length is. Are we doing continuous delivery? Are we doing two-week sprints, four-week sprints? We need to understand that so that we are able to get our best pricing on a fixed price contract, both for us and working with our vendors. Now, we also have the possibility of doing a time and materials contract. In the case of a time and materials contract, we are going to potentially look at, we talked about in a previous Auspicious Agile video, Agile video blog, the uh, t-shirt sizing approach where we look at price for feature or price for, for story. And when we do that, that can give us a relative understanding of what it's going to cost if we want 10 small stories or if we want five large stories, what that cost should be and give us a reasonable idea of what the time and materials would be. We can also look at new and incremental models. As we talked about, 
where we can go ahead and pay for one increment or one set of iterations to begin with and see if that is going to be successful and then we can choose whether we want to pay for a second or third. So we can contract in that way, right into the contract that we have the option to continue or maybe make the option to develop something else to change the project or the work if we're not happy with the work for the first iteration. So we pay for the first iteration and we proceed there, but we might decide to pivot or to persevere as to whether we want to pay for additional iterations and we write that into our contracts. Now, we also need to look at return on investment. So we've got our contract in place, we're working with our vendors, we need to be able to understand and articulate to senior management, to the executive team, to the board, what is the return on investment that we're seeing for these agile investments and initiatives. Very essential for us. So the way that we are going to do that is we're going to take the information that we already have from our contracts. We're going to look at a definition here from Investopedia, which tells us that return on investment is gain from investment minus cost of investment over the cost of the investment. So let's look first at the gain on the investment. The gain on the, from the investment, we can look at by simply seeing what money we make from the market. Either we have externally in the market, we're going to make money from uh, this project or this agile program, or we are going to save costs internally potentially as well. So there's a monetary measure for what the gain is in the market. Now we also need to look at what the cost of the investment is. And the cost of the investment, if it's a fixed price contract, it's fairly easy. We just look at that fixed price contract, we understand what's in it, it tells us what the cost is. If we were doing the time and materials, we figured out what the reasonable amount was going to be by knowing the size of the work, and we can look at what the cost is in terms of time and materials. Hopefully it was very close to what we had expected. If it changed a lot, we should plan for that as we review, review contracts and come to the next round of time and materials contracts. And then we talked about other models, alternative, new, and innovative models, such as the incremental, where we can actually pivot or persevere, and we can understand what the cost is and how many sprints or iterations we paid for, how many we did, and if we chose to continue with that as well. So there are several models we can look at, both for working with Agile contracts and our partners. Please consider these, and uh, hopefully they're food for thought. Thanks for listening, and as always, stay Agile.